Thing. Now, please help me enthusiastically welcome our speaker, Michaela. Oh, God. Hi, family. My name is Michaela, and I'm an alcoholic. Yeah. Ooh, we got a lot of people in here tonight. Huh. <laughs> it doesn't matter how many times I do this. It doesn't matter if there's two people or 200 people. It doesn't matter where I am or how long it's been, um, this fear, right? This like crippling absolute fear. But at the end of the day, we get up here and, and this is a privilege. So like, thank you guys for having me. <laughs> um, I get a phone call and it's like, Mikhail, this is Mike Bennett. <laughs> I'd like to ask you to speak on this thing. He's like, I'm gonna need you to uh, dress up and not use the F word. And I was like, oh God, oh God. <laughs> I was like, I'll do what I can for you, Mike, you know? Um, Let's see here. Sorry, I got a little sidetracked. Um, you know, we're just going to start from the beginning. We're going to keep it moving. Um, I have a gratitude for this program that I don't have words for. I don't. It has saved my life repeatedly. It has taught me how to live in a different manner than I think my family could have ever taught me how to live. Um, and the people, the people I've met in these rooms, the people I've met in these rooms, like, have my soul. Like, I'm looking at, like, 20 of them right now. Um, the people that I've met in these rooms are, are life-changing for me. But, um... I grew up in Pennsylvania, right? I'm one of nine kids in this giant dysfunctional Sicilian family, like dysfunctional. If any of you um, know anything about like Catholic Sicilians, it was a nightmare. And somehow through that, I was the only alcoholic that came out of those nine kids, like mind blowing. And uh, <clears throat> you know, looking back as far back as I can remember, everybody's, not everybody. I've heard a lot of people say they knew that they were different from the time they were kids. And like, I relate to that, you know, from as far back as I can remember, having that anxiety, like I was hyper, I was all over the place. I never felt a part of anywhere from as far back as I can remember. Um, you know, being a kid, constantly searching for a place that feels like home and like never finding that, you know. Um, I could fit in anywhere externally, you know. Um, I became a chameleon and that like kind of, I use that as like a survival tactic throughout my entire life, but I could fit in everywhere, make, make it look like I'm fitting in, right, just to kind of get by. And um, did any of you ever go on a, a Washington field trip in eighth grade? Any of you? Okay, yeah. So I started drinking a little bit before that, and I, my parents get a phone call and getting sent home from Washington for sneaking in bottles of vodka and smoking cigarettes in a hotel room. Okay, so that was like the kind of child that I was. And, it, and we just kind of like took off from there. Um, I found drinking fairly early, and it worked. You know, I found drinking very early, and it worked. It took away the anxiety, the stress, the... And even at a young age, I was not a social drinker. You know, I found myself up back at my parents' house with cans of Budweiser's and Marlboro's out of my dad's truck. You know, couldn't wait to get out of school just to have that moment because I felt like I could breathe. Um, you know, so let's like fast forward a little bit. Like I said, I, I was the problem child, right? A lot of trouble, a lot, a lot of trouble. Um, let's see, arrested at 14 on school property for underage drinking. We can go further a few more years, another seven underage drinkings, battery charges, all of these things, right? Um, in my head, it's the town, right? In my head, it's the people. In my head, it's my father. In my head, it's, it's all of these things, right? It's not me. None of these things have anything to do with me, right? And, um, you know, I can't remember far back to, like, a sober breath before, like, 13, like a real, true, sober breath. I knew I was different from my friends, from my peers, from my siblings, because they were able to stop. You know what I'm saying? That's where I knew that there was a difference between me and them. They were able to go home and do their homework or do whatever the hell that they had to do. And I'm, you know what I mean? Like I said, in the back of my parents' house, Bob's Budweiser. You know what I'm saying? So from a very early age, I knew that I was different. Um, I managed to graduate high school, and like I literally, <laughs> we laugh about this. I'm pretty sure my parents paid off the guidance counselor because I was never there, ever. And when I was there, I was loaded. And so um, I managed to graduate high school, and I want to get out of that town. I want to get away from those people. I want to get away from the name that I had kind of made for myself in that area. You know, um, there was a lot. My childhood was a lot. So <laughs> I pack up uh, my Jeep Wrangler, right? I'm 18 years old. And uh, I don't know if you guys remember, like, MapQuest. I'm, fucking, I'm old. Excuse my mouth. Um, so, like, right now, like, I'm on the Internet, and I'm searching up these places in Florida. Never been to Florida, ever, right? And I find this restaurant that's hiring in Boynton Beach, and I'm like, cool, I'm going there. I MapQuest this, right? I have money saved up from the graduation that I didn't deserve. And um, I pack up what I can, and I leave. 
I leave. I leave and I, and I land in Boynton Beach. And believe it or not, I got that job at that restaurant and, and ended up getting myself like a little apartment. And um, I brought me with me. You know, I used to say like, oh my God, I ran into a group of people. That's totally false. I sought out people that were like me and it didn't take very long, you know, and they kind of showed up in the form of like 40 year old fishermen that had been like thrown up by their wives with cocaine addictions and stuff. I mean, this is literally like, that's kind of what that looked like, but that was fine. You know what I mean? That was fine. They were getting me what I needed at the time and I was making friends. Mom, I'm making friends. Florida's great. And, uh, you know, I'm going to try to respect the house that I made, right? Um. But other things came into the picture. You know what I mean? Other things had always come into the picture. They had built up and built up and built up. And um, I'm in Florida in 2003, and, um, you know, some other things come into the picture. Am I allowed to do that? We're going to run it. Opiates come into the picture, right? And for me, that was a game changer. That was an absolute game changer for me. The aha moment that people talk about, why am I not doing this every single day of my life? I'm not hanging I'm hungover like whiskey does. You know what I'm saying? It, It became this thing. And immediately, immediately, we pushed forward. There was no breaks. There was no, maybe I should put this down for a minute. No, we kept it moving. So in the meantime, right, I'm, I'm living the life in South Florida. I'm 18 years old in South Florida on my own, you know, working at a bar, my four-year-old friends, like we're having a blast, you know, and uh, I meet the man I'm going to marry. <laughs> and uh, his entire family's law enforcement, right? And we don't enjoy the same things. So my double life that I mastered as a kid immediately came into play. <laughs> yeah, buddy. Immediately came into play in this part of my life, right? Like, I'm looking at his family, right, and the dynamic. He had um, two kids from a prior relationship, and I liked how that looked. So I was going to be and do and say whatever I had to to kind of fit into that mold, right? Now, now at this time, I have no idea what I'm suffering from. I don't know what alcoholism is. You know what I'm saying? I have no idea that these are patterns. I don't know any of these things. They're like, they come as like nature, I guess, if that makes any sense. So yeah, so I do what I have to do to fit into this mold, right? And, um, and I lived like that for a very long time. It was like this double life. On the outside, things looked really, really good. Inside, we're starting to burn a little bit. You know what I mean? Inside, the early stages of like early addiction where like I had a moment, I had a moment, we had moved into our first house and like, I was running low, you know what I'm saying? And I was, I was gonna put it down, like I was gonna put it down for a minute. And um, I couldn't put it down, you know, that was terrifying. You have those lucid moments, right? An active addiction, an active alcoholism, where you kinda get to see like what's going on in your world and that's what happened and it was like, oh no, you know, we're gonna have a problem from here on out. So anyways, I managed to get a, a job on mega yachts, right? <laughs> and uh, I fell into this job on my ass, I'm not going to lie. And it was a lot of fun, so now I'm traveling a lot, okay? I'm in Miami six months a year, I'm in New York six months a year, I'm in the Caribbean, I'm, I'm, I'm all over the place, right? And um, in my head, nobody's seeing what's going on. So I'm making a lot more money, so what does that mean? In my head, I need more and I need more and I need more, right? I'm away from my family, I'm working 90 hours a week, I'm exhausted, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I have the financial means to kind of get what I need at this point, right? So I'm doctor shopping. You know, in, in Manhattan, I have dealers meeting me at the dock in Miami. I'm, it was exhausting, but I made it work because I felt like I had to make it work. You know what I'm saying? Um, now, now, there were a couple parts of my story that are really, really hard to talk about, and for years I didn't talk about them. Like, I didn't. And um, I kind of hit this point where, you know, when I come into the rooms, I need to hear women that are raw and authentic and messy and honest because listening to them and seeing them cross over that threshold makes me believe that I'm going to live. Um, you know, I carried that the last couple of years, and I remember very, very, very clearly sitting back there not too long ago, completely falling apart in that chair, falling apart, and, and having a woman get up and talk about how this program had saved her life and what she had to do to get to that point. So anyways, um, <clears throat> I get pregnant with my first son, and I firmly believe in my heart, right? Like, this is it. This is going to be that staple. Okay, this is big enough to make me stop because nothing else is. Right, I've tried everything else at this point, clearly. You know, under wraps, I've tried everything else, and nothing is working. So this is going to be it, right? Because I'm not going to be one of those mothers. I'm not going to be one of those women. I'm going to get my shit together, right? I'm going to come home, and I'm going to be a good wife, you know, and I'm going to make money, and we're going to live. And, and I couldn't do that. I couldn't do that. Um, I couldn't do it. And, and the guilt and the shame that came with that is the words for that I don't have. I don't know if you know, if any of you in here can relate to that, but the guilt and the shame that came with that um, was atrocious. You know, my family looking at me, why can't you just stop? How can you not just stop? 
you loved your husband, you would stop. If you gave a shit about your career, you would stop. If you want to be a mother to this child, you'll stop. And what they couldn't understand is I can't stop, you know? So I don't know what I'm suffering from at this point. Now, I, I'm a monster in my head. Who does this? Who lives like this? You know, and if it wasn't bad enough the first time, I did it again with the second. You know, and now now we're living, right? Like we have this like functional life. Like I'm living, right? We have this big fancy house. We have these cars. I'm working all over the place. And, and I can put pictures up on Facebook and be like, everything's great. Everything's fine. Inside, I'm dying. Inside, I'm dying. You know what I mean? It's that utter hate for yourself. Um, I'm never present. I'm never present. Those kids can be right in front of my face. And I can't even tell you what color their eyes are. I mean, literally, that's like where I was at. It was awful, you know? Um, and it lived like that for a long time. You know, it hit some pretty awful points. And, and who ended up doing an intervention with me was the captain on the boat. And he sat me down. And he was like, Michaela, we're not going to watch you kill yourself anymore. You know, you're going to rehab. That's what they told me. This was back then. And, uh, you know, so, so I come back down to Florida and I go to rehab. And the thing is, you guys, I come into these rooms and I don't hear anything that they're talking about. I do absolutely no work, right? I go in and I get on Suboxone Maintenance and I meet this cute little Cuban boy and he understands me, right? So, like, that's what I did in rehab. You know, it worked out really well. Um, I got, things went really well at home when I got out. Let me tell you, things have never been better at home. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I can laugh about it now, but the sickness of our disease, right? I come home and within no time, everything's gone. The house, the cars my husband, my children, right? Everything I cared about slowly slipping away. And instead of fighting to get those things back, I didn't. I didn't fight. I didn't fight to get them back. I went through this downward spiral from hell, right? Like, I don't deserve them. I don't deserve them. And things got really, 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 really dark from there. I laugh because my story has, like, these crazy, there's different lifetimes inside of lifetimes. How do you go from working on mega yachts in Miami to being homeless in Pompano, Florida? And have you ever been there? That was a good time. <laughs> You know, vacation, vacation spot. You know what I mean? And that's like what my story looked like. So, uh, so I ended up burning around South Florida like an asshole. Excuse my mouth. Bar hopping, you know, county to county to county. And what I would do is I'd get a bartending job and a place to stay, right? And I would do whatever I had to do to keep that. Whatever I had to do to keep that. And I'd burn every bridge in my vicinity and I'd keep it moving because this is what Michaela does. Selfish, self-centered insanity. You know, a lot of it isn't even intentional, in, intentional, but this is how I operate. You know, I'm burning people I care about. And it's not even intentional, but this is how I operate. I had a guy a long time ago deem me Hurricane Michaela, and I laughed. He said, yeah, you know, you don't give a shit about anybody, and I didn't. I didn't. Um, I was strictly in survival mode. Do what I have to do, do what I have to do, do what I have to do. Um, so from here, we land up a little bit, you know, further up in Florida from where I I don't even, long story, but I land in this place, right, with these people, and um, they were a little bit further along in the criminal world than I was, you know, and I thought they were amazing. I was like, these people don't care that I'm a scumbag mom. They don't care that I do X, Y, and Z to get by. They don't give a shit about any of those things, and I found, like, I had found my pack, like, my people, you know, and similar to my alcoholism, by the time I realized I was in trouble, I was in serious trouble. Um, this went on for years, and... <laughs> I don't really get into to detail about those years of my life, but I will tell you what it did to me mentally. Um, you know, a lot of guns, a lot of drugs, a lot of violence, like really gross, gross amounts of violence, like shattered families, um, pain, pain on top of pain, and trying to cover up that pain. And like, at this time of my life, that's what my life looks like, right? My alcoholism is the only thing that I have to hold on to to survive. That is it. That's the lifeline. That's the lifeline. That's where I'm at. Um, it brought me to a bottom that still to this day I look back and it, and it hurts my soul. You know what I mean? Um, a desperate, awful, awful bottom. By the time I was coming out of that, and there was a lot of running and a lot of back and forth and in and out of jail, in and out of jail, in and out of jail kind of shit. Um, I had nobody, man. I had nobody because I had to have nobody. You know, I, I had attempted to go back and get my children and, um, they ended up taking my kids to North Carolina. They took them from me, far from me, because I didn't care about the law, and I would break in any window to try to see them. I would kick any door. I would do anything that I had to do selfishly to get to those kids. So they took them to North Carolina. And um, <laughs> I write this letter to my ex-husband, right, and I have it notarized, right? Genius, you know, and I'm doing the right thing. If, you, if I ever do this again, you can take them, I swear. I mean, they're already gone. 
you know, they're gone. They're like 3,000 miles away, Michaela, that's fine. You know, if you ever take them, you know, I'll kill myself is what I told him. And he goes, newsflash, Michaela, you're killing yourself. And that was it. And that was it. I had nothing. I know my parents couldn't take anymore. You know, that last little bit, I, I tried to call my mother, and she was like, I love you, but you can't stay here. They couldn't take anymore. So uh, long story short, <laughs> run around South Florida, and, and, you know, I land in this place, and I'm, I'm in this apartment, right, with this arsenal of weapons, and, like, I absolutely hate myself because I don't have the balls to pick one up and use one. I am dead in here. You know what I mean? It is black. It is awful. And... And I didn't have the balls to pick one up and use it. Um, I was at that point. So there was one person <laughs> that, I, that I had in my life that uh, we ran together. And we, we were real effing trash, like let me tell you. We were really disgusting human beings. And um, <laughs> I'm seeing pictures on him, and he's like dressed like a human. You know, there's pictures of him with his mother. Like his eyes looked different. He was working, and I was like, you know, we don't do things like that. <laughs> like, what happened to you? But I called him. I called him for help out of complete desperation. And at that point, he had had three years sober. He got into the program. He did the work. Alcoholics Anonymous saved his life. And in turn, what did he do for me? He drags me into this, uh, the, the section eight halfway house. Okay, I want you guys to imagine this because this isn't a, the treatment centers out here. We're in a ha section eight, Lake Worth, Florida, 60 lunatics like myself. Okay, and I get dropped off there, and I got a book bag and 20 bucks and a bunch of heartache and a bunch of pain and a bunch of regret. And I'm angry, and I'm mean, and, and I don't know how to operate, right? So I'm coming out of what I was just coming out of. I don't know how to be human anymore, you guys. The human part of me was long gone. The human part of me was long gone before my episode with, with organized crime. So I come in, and I don't know how to be around these people. I don't know how to keep my hands to myself, right? I don't, I don't know how to, like, function. And the first thing I do when they walk in is they say, are you hungry? What do you need? Do you need a shower? Do you need some clothes? And I was like, who the are these people like who are these people but I'm watching right because we're observing because that's what we do and they're happy man there are a bunch of people running around they look like me they look like me but they're smiling and they're happy and the music's going and I was so confused so this woman comes up to do my intake and she's this docile sweet little thing right and I'm the antichrist tearing through this place I have no insurance no money so I'm kicking cold turkey oh yeah kicking cold turkey 98 degree weather and uh, <laughs> she goes, have you uh, ever worked a program before? And I had absolutely no idea what that meant, and that was okay. That was okay. Are you done, and what are you willing to do? And those, it's exactly what she asked me. Are you done, and what are you willing to do? At that point, I would have eaten cigarette butts if she told me to. Like, I was so just, you guys know the feeling. I don't have to tell you. You wouldn't be sitting in this room right now. You know what I mean? That utter, complete defeat. So what do we do? We start, we start getting into step one. And here was the thing, you guys. I had no idea of what alcoholism was and sometimes they get in these rooms and I wonder if you guys know what alcoholism is a lot of times we'll raise our hands and I'll be like hey my name's Michaela and I'm an alcoholic but do we really understand what that means you know we think like the unmanageability is external it's not external it's all internal it's all internal you know what I mean I don't feel comfortable anywhere I am etc 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 the bedevilments in this book are, are completely on point but you know, I look at these steps on the wall, and it's like reading a newspaper, you guys. You're only getting the first small little bit. You know, if you actually go into that book, you're going to see how deep these things actually are. Um, so I, I had a, for a, a thorough first step. I lived my first step out there. I tried absolutely everything and anything to stop, and I could not. I couldn't do it. It didn't matter what I had. It didn't matter what I didn't have. It was all in here. I was busted up in here. And I couldn't do it. So, um, so we, we start to, you know, we're getting through some work, and I'm getting a little bit better, right? I'm becoming a little more like a human being, right? And, and the God thing kind of comes up. And, and, you know, like I said, I'm raised with, like, Sicilian Catholic dysfunction. So if any of you know what that looks like, right? Yeah, I was going to hell. <laughs> like, you know, I had accepted that a long time ago. You know, I could pray really well from the back of cop cars. Like, I was professional at that. I was, we used to call, excuse me, the booty call God. Like, I'm in trouble. Come get me. Like, that's when I prayed, man. You know, just get me out of this one more time, I swear to God. I swear, swear to God, just one more time, you know. And uh, I didn't understand what a personal relationship with God looked like, and that was okay. None of that mattered. It didn't matter. I started as small as I would hit my knees and say, would you effing help me? That's what I started with. And it started to work. And I'm not one of those that's going to get up in here and say, I'm not going to talk about God to offend anybody. I'm going to talk about God from the top of my lungs. That's the only thing that saved a raging alcoholic like me, you know, from the gates of death. Literally. 
It was that. You know, so we get through the rest of the work, and, and I find this personal relationship with God, right? Yeah, I'm so sick, I'm sorry. Sicker <laughs> than others. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I, I get through the rest of the work, and all of a sudden I have this, like, life, right? Like, we're building this life. People, like, real, authentic relationships in my world. All of a sudden I'm gaining things back, right? Like, I'm employable, all of these things. Um, my early, early sobriety for me back then was a nightmare. I mean... I, uh, I had been running from some pretty heavy charges, you know? And I went and I turned myself in, right? I was, they hit me with 18 months and I was gonna do it. I was ready to go. I kissed my kids goodbye. I had my kids at that point, occasionally, you know? I grabbed my whites, I had money for my books. And I went and I turned myself into Palm Beach County. And uh, because of this work and because of the things that I was doing and because of how active I was in the community, my probation officer wrote a letter to the governor. They pulled me out four days, four days and told me keep doing what you're doing and let me out. This is the kind of shit I'm talking about, you guys. It's not materialistic, it's none of those things, it's like what it does for our soul, right? So anyways, I'm gonna speed up because I don't even know where I'm at. <laughs> so I get through the rest of work and life is absolutely beautiful, right? I put together time, I mean time for me, it was like three and a half years, right? And I do the apartment thing and I have the career thing and I do the boyfriend thing, right? And I have my kids and then all of a sudden, <laughs> I start to take credit for these things, right? Like I did this. I got this job, I got my kids back, I'm keeping myself sober, yada, 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 stop becoming about, it was not about God's grace anymore, it was about Michaela, you know, and then I got um, angry and miserable and I got high, and that's what happened, after three and a half years I went out, and it, and it was quick, and within two months I lost everything all over again, where they say we pick up right where we left off, that was true for me, and um, the pain of actually having a spiritual experience, right? Having being in the work and like being obsessed and in love with this program, but getting disconnected, laying on a bathroom floor with my bottle, crying over a book of Alcoholics Anonymous, and that's a true story. That's a true story. Um, I knew what I needed to get back. I just couldn't bring myself to do it. Uh, things got real ugly there for a little bit. I'm not gonna lie. There was. <laughs> Once again, running around the streets of Pompano, and some awful, 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 awful things happened to me when I was down there. And uh, in the middle of the night, like 2 o'clock in the morning, I get a, a text message from a girl that I had sponsored for years, and she said, I need you to live. And for some reason, that text message alone made me pick up the phone. It made me pick up the phone. Here's where I am, and I'm hurting, and I'm in trouble. And what did they do? They got in that car, and they came and got me. And friends that I had gotten sober with years prior had opened up their own center, right? They didn't even have a bed for me, and they bring me in there with nothing. 102 pounds, gray, my face complete, couldn't see out of this eye, my arms so busted up I couldn't open them. And two girls that I didn't know pushed their beds together and helped nurse me back to life. That is a program of Alcoholics Anonymous. Once again, okay, so I'm gonna keep hitting on that, right? So anyways, these were the people in my world. You know what I'm saying? These were the things that had happened. Um, once you get through the work for me, getting, drinking is never the same again. It is never the same again. You can't get the same high, you can't get the same buzz. It, you have too much knowledge of what's going on with you. You can never get high the same again. And um, you know, I had this awareness um, I had this awareness. I was just really, 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 really struggling to um, to kind of to kind of pull it together. So one of my friends do. They put me on a plane and they sent me to Prescott, Arizona. They lied. Okay, first of all, everybody lied. It's going to Phoenix, right? So I'm from South Florida. Okay, um, I come with things that a girl from South Florida would bring, like shorts and t-shirts. And I get here and it's 17 degrees, and we're in the mountains. Okay, and it's a nine-week program. And uh, my best friend's like, listen, 20 days, we'll let you AMA, we'll fly you home. <laughs> I call them that 20 days, they were like, this is going to be fine. Everything's fine. <laughs> they're talking to my therapist on speaker. Like, she gets a little wild, but she'll simmer down. She's going she's gonna to get a little wild, but she, <laughs> she's going to simmer down. I was pissed, pissed. I did not want to be here. I did not want to know any of you guys. You are not my Florida people. <sighs> said this all the time. You're not. You can't handle me. <laughs> what am I doing here? I mean, this was literally a constant. So, you know, my story is kind of all over the place, but I hope you guys are, are grasping what's going on here. So I go to treatment here in Prescott, Arizona, right? And once again, but with an awareness, I do absolutely no work. I do no work. I go hiking, and I meet a boy from Washington. Yeah, yeah, we did that. And... Uh, <laughs> And, then, and this is what we do. And in the back of my mind, right, because I'm not an idiot. Like, I'm not an idiot. I know exactly what I'm doing. 
I know exactly what I'm doing. I know exactly what's going to happen. My definition of insanity isn't expecting something different. My definition of insanity is doing it knowing exactly what is going to happen from here. Exactly what is going to happen from here. And I do it anyways, right? So um, there, there was a lot of heartache going on, right? I'm, now, I'm, now I'm away from my kids, bro, like really away from my kids. And I didn't really know how to handle that. So, um, so I decided to, <laughs> to start going back and forth from Florida to... Uh, to uh, where are we? Arizona, and um, <laughs> so disconnected it isn't even funny. No tools in the tool bag whatsoever, and with an idea back here that um, I can get what I want when I get off that plane in a hotel, and nobody's gonna bother me for a couple days. I'm gonna go see my kids. I'm gonna go home, and I and I tried it. I I did that for a little while. I'm not gonna lie, to you guys. Uh, you know, there was this small part of me that was like, no. And um, I go to drop my kids off the first time I went down there to their dad after a weekend. And my youngest says, why do you love Arizona more than us? <sighs> Couldn't deal with it. Couldn't take it. <laughs> Collapsed right there. Couldn't take it. There was absolutely no connection. You know what I'm saying? So I did this for a while, you guys. I'm not going to lie. I did this for a while. There was a lot of back and forth. There was a lot of bullshit. This is what I did. Um, I tried to pretend like things were well up here. That was a joke. Everybody knew what was going on. And um, so getting to the end here... I, uh, what time we're at. I decided I'm going to go down to Florida for a few weeks after I had left Pennsylvania for a few weeks. So, so really, I haven't been home for a while, okay? In my head, um, my kids are on break. My kids are on break. And um, this is the perfect time to spend time with them. Meanwhile, everybody in my vicinity is like, what are you doing? What are you doing? I'm like, I'm only going to bring enough, and I have enough subs, right? I have enough subs that I can do this, and I'm going to be fine. And what happened for that, you know, couple weeks down in Florida, um, I'm still working on forgiving myself for. My children are 11 and 13 now. They had never really seen their mom in active addiction, right? And coming out of a blackout, having to look at what, what had happened there. So when I went to kiss those kids, I hugged, I hugged them extra tight, right? It was January 1st of this year. I dropped them off at their dad's house. I hugged them as tight as I could because I knew I was not going to see them for a while. Uh, my youngest clinging on to me because he knew they weren't going to see me for a while. And um, I left there with every intention to come straight back to Arizona. My girls in Florida were like, you're going home, you're getting help, it's enough of this, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, okay, okay. So in my sickness, right, uh, my heart is, is, is broken. It's shattered. And I, I can't deal with it. I absolutely can't deal with it. So what do I do? I managed to get a couple of my little... Renee, a couple of my little bottles, and put them in an Aleve bottle, and I somehow managed to get that on an airplane and to Washington. I call my sister on the phone, I call my family on the phone, and they think I'm suicidal, and so in a certain way I am, right? My life is over. I did this again. I did this to them again. I did this to them again. I mean, if this doesn't go to show you how powerful what we're fighting is, I don't know what possibly could. I would nuke countries for those children, and I'm the one hurting them, and I can't stop. So I, I get a little bit on this airplane, and I get to Washington, and I'm trying to rush my sister off the phone just so I can get what I need to get on my next flight, right? I just need to, to do what I got to do to get on this next flight, and I hang up with her, and I do what I do in that bathroom, and I wake up resuscitated. Um, I was not trying to kill myself, but in turn, because of the heartache, because of what I was reaching out for, that's what happened that day. I died in a bathroom in a Washington airport. So I'm totally lying. Dallas, Dallas airport. Um, yeah, the Dallas airport. I managed to get back to Phoenix. And I said, I'm going to detox, right? I'm going to go to detox. We're going to go to detox, okay? We're going to detox. I'm going to do four days in detox, okay? Four days. <laughs> four days. I go home. Haven't seen anybody in my house for like a million years. Worst girlfriend ever, okay? Just trash. And uh, I have, everything's fine. Everything's fine. <laughs> Oh, God. So I pack a double bag for four days, and I'm going to treatment for four days, right? And I get, in, I get into detox, and my friends are like, yeah, we're, mm -mm. we're going to stay for eight. And I was like, fine, we'll stay for eight. And then it turned into, you're not going home, you're going to res. And I was like, you know, I'm going to res. Like, I'm going home. They were like, you're going to res for two weeks. And it was this constant battle, and I lost <laughs> over and over and over and over. But here's the thing, you guys, and here's what I didn't like. You learn as you go, right? That stint in treatment was exactly what I needed at the time. I needed a break. I needed a break between me and my substance. I needed a minute to clear out. I had to do those things. Um, what I was just coming out of was kind of traumatic. And like I said, you come out of the blackout and things are a little traumatic, right? They're traumatic. And, um, and I, needed, I needed serious help. So um,
emotionally. <laughs> I thought I had been in pain before. I did. Like I thought I had experienced pain. I thought I experienced pain when my kids were in North Carolina. I thought I experienced pain a million times, you guys. Like a million times. There are a million times. Like facing 25 years in federal prison. Like there were a million times that I was like hurting and angry and empty. But this time, <laughs> when I once again lived my first step, hard enough in the face where I could where I could breathe it in. When my substance isn't even working to take the heartache away anymore, then what do we do? What do we do? My substance isn't even enough to take the heartache away anymore. It doesn't work anymore. It's not working anymore. So um, I came in and I got freaking messy, you guys. Like messy. And I didn't give a shit. I sat in those rooms and I cried and I screamed at the top of my lungs that I didn't want to live anymore. That I didn't want to live anymore. I mean, begging, asking for help, praying like I had never prayed before. You know, I get the call while I'm in treatment that, um, the, you know, the paperwork's drawn up. He wants me to sign over my children, right? Dad ends up in the ICU. All of these things, like all of these things just compiling, compiling, compiling. And in my head, the only way out was suicide. So um, I'm game planning, right? I'm game planning in my head. And, and what ends up happening is I end up getting sent to this other place. And I was pissed, let me tell you. Anybody that knows me in early sobriety, like I apologize. I absolutely apologize from the bottom of my heart because it's talking about like loving the absolute unlovable. So um, I get to this place and how God shows up in your world through other people is absolutely mind-blowing. The things that I, I, I prayed for, the things that I begged for, like, please just give me something to keep me going. Please just give me something to keep me going. And he did that. He did that repeatedly. Um, you know, I remember specifically, I'm on this back porch at this place, right? And I just got to this place. I don't want to be at this place. I'm not a happy camper, right? I, I hate everybody and everything and myself and you guys and just everything. Everything's absolutely miserable. And I get to this place. I'm on the back porch and I'm on the phone with my sponsor, and we are so far past, like, hysterical, it isn't even funny. For some reason, it was done in my head, but I was still asking for help. That was not me. That was something bigger than me kind of reaching through. And, you know, me yelling to her on the phone, how do you live through this? How? You tell me right now how you live through this pain. Because I can't do it. My heart is going to break. If I can't have them, I don't want to be here anymore. And she had to yell over me, and she said, I don't give a fuck how much you're hurting. I don't care how angry you are. I don't care about the thoughts running through your head. You're going to go to bed in that bed, and you're going to wake up in that bed, and we're going to try again tomorrow. One of these days, you're going to want to live. And that's what we did. That's what we did this time. This time was emotional, and it was messy, and it, it was out there. You guys, you want to talk about like real authentic bullshit, everything out. Um, I did more work this time than I've ever done in my entire life. And, and what I've learned is I've combined Alcoholics Anonymous, right? Like this this knowledge that I have from Alcoholics Anonymous on how to live and what I actually truly suffer from, and I'm combining it with other things, and it's becoming this like explosion of holy shit, things that I should have realized my entire life. I'm actually learning about why I became the way I became, which made me drink. What put me in a position to be this neurotic, psychotic little thing that needed booze to calm down? We're getting back to the very, to the very essence of things, and, and it's the most beautiful experience I've ever had. Um, I know a lot of people will get up here, and I'm just gonna go around, it's just, I'm running, I'm running for it. You know, a lot of people will get up here and they will um, bash the treatment scene out here, and here's, here's what I'm thinking, you guys. Um, we are battling something so much bigger than we were battling 10 years ago, right? Like for me, my generation's dying. They're dying um, every day. And you know, what I'm hoping we can do is educate everybody you know what I'm saying? While we're in treatment, let's learn about what we suffer from. The first time I went through the doctors, I mean, it completely changed my life. All of a sudden, I didn't feel like that monster anymore, right? A book that was written 100 years ago, and they're talking about me. The feelings are the same. The actions are the same. Everything is the same. And I didn't feel so alone. It changed my life. And I just feel like we need to be educating each other on what we suffer from so we give each other a fighting chance. Um, you know, I've been doing a lot of extra work this time, a lot of work, a lot of therapy, a lot of trauma work, and you know, I used to bash that too. You guys are babies. Who does inner child work? You keep your daddy issues at home. Like, I was so, like, literally, that's how I was. I was literally, that's how I was. You know, daddy issues for days, nobody cares. Like, just so gross. <laughs> 
I told a guy one time his mommy issues were debilitating. That's the kind of human <laughs> being I was, right? But this time out of, a, out of a state of like absolute, like I said, utter hopelessness, right? Utter absolute hopelessness, I started doing, doing things another way. And, and in turn, I've met some really amazing, beautiful people that have been able to guide me and love me. And um, the changes have been just, just mind-blowing. Um, I'm laughing. I operate one way my entire life. I operate one way my entire life. Um, there's a core belief on how things should be done in, in my way, in my eyes. And, and I suffered a lot throughout my entire life because of that. I was... Um, a very nice girl, you know what I mean? I was very, what did the therapist say today? She hates watching suffering, but she'll cause suffering if she feels like suffering's needed. And I was like, good God almighty, but that's kind of like what it was. And, um, you know, struggling, even in Alcoholics Anonymous, struggling to like get a hold on that, struggling to get a hold on that. And like I said, the extra tools that I've gained. I had um, this woman that, that I love dearly, um, you know, kind of shed some light on some things for me. My, my alcoholism doesn't just stem, it's not just alcoholism, you guys. It will show up in any way, shape, or form. It can show up as anything. It can show up in dudes, it can show up in fighting, it can show up as anything. You know what I'm saying? I'm doing anything to kind of fill this void in here, anything. And, um, and you know, she had, had brought some light from things from, so, I'm stuttering like an idiot. <laughs> you know, I'd gotten in that mode and I was struggling and, and she, um, this might not make sense to you guys, but this was so powerful for me that I'm going to get it from the podium. I'm going to say it every friggin' time. I wanted to go do things that I shouldn't be allowed to do, and I was zoned in, right? It's like when that, that moment hits where you're like, I'm getting high. That's what I'm doing. There's nothing anybody can say to stop me. That's kind of where I was at, and um, the whole, you're going to lose your children. You're going to go back to prison. Blah, blah, none of those things were like hitting me, you know? It was just like we were zoned in, and, and this woman called me, and she made me sit down, and she made me close my eyes, and she said, I want you to imagine you're holding your oldest son. And she goes, I want you to smell his hair. What color are his eyes? Tell me what color his eyes are. And she goes, that's what you're going to lose. And that was enough to knock me straight back into the game, to get straight back into the game, to get straight back into the work. You know what I'm saying? What's important? Um, this has been painful, and this has been awful, but this program is absolutely frigging phenomenal. You know, you get through the work. The obsession to use is gone, right? And we talk about being recovered. Like, the obsession to use is gone when you're recovered. You can walk. It's freedom. You can't put a price on that. And it comes from work. It comes from being honest. It comes from getting empty. You know what I mean? Like, let's, like, throw it all out here. It comes from learning how to trust. Um, and if it was able to, to tame somebody like me and turn me into somebody like this, like, I'm forever grateful. Um, I have my family back in my life today. Um, still struggling with things with my children, but I have my children back in a, to an extent in my life today. Um, wonderful, amazing people, a job with people that love me. I'm actually living, it's not just about putting down the drugs and alcohol to put down the drugs and alcohol, it's about learning how to live again. Learning with peace, or living with peace and living with happiness, and that's what this is about. That's what this is about. Um, I feel like I've just been rambling on. I don't even know what time it is, guys. Are we close? Five more minutes. Five more minutes. <clears throat> Do the work. Find somebody that has what you want, right? And hold on to them for dear life. You know what I'm saying? Find a sponsor. Like, find a sponsor and really get into the work. Hold on to people that, like, watch. Use your eyes. We're observant, you guys. My God. Most of us survived for how long? We're pretty observant. Watch with your eyes. Don't go to people that you've been sober with for 30 days for help because we're both retarded. Literally. <laughs> Let me get, what should I do here? I don't know what I should do here. I don't know. I just landed back in treatment at 36 with a fucking book bag. So I don't, but I can tell you how to do this. Like, stop it. You know what I mean? Go into these rooms. Find people that have what you want and do what they tell you to do. Get out of the way. Sit down and shut up. And I promise you, you guys, you will have an experience. I promise you, you will. Put the expectations down. Put it needs to be done this way, this way, this way down and just be. And I promise you, it will change your life. I promise. Um, I don't even know if this made any sense, but thank you for having me, guys. You know. Okay, let's give another big hand for our speaker. Yeah.